From what the craft is to the reaches of space it's reached and what science we use to talk with it, join me as we explain how we communicate with the Voyager space probe. Space is a place where we know a lot and yet know very little. Through our various technologies we have crossed many boundaries, seen planets and wonders that continue to marvel us to this day, but we only know a small fraction of the universe as a whole. This is why we rely on things like the Voyager space probes to go out into the universe and deliver us information that we didn't have before, and hope that they last as long as possible so that we can keep getting that info. For those that don't know, Voyager 1 is a probe that humanity sent out to observe the universe at large, and it's currently well past Pluto and has shown us many things about our solar system. In 2017 it was set at around 138 AUs from our planet. AU means astronomical unit, which means the distance from the Earth to the Sun. So 138 AUs means that it's 138 times farther than the Earth is from the Sun right now. That's a really big number, over 12 billion miles to be exact. That's the farthest anything from man has traveled in space. One of its crowning achievements was a photograph showing a set of sunbeams, and one of those sunbeams was Earth. It was a dot, a dot in a grander scale photograph of our own solar system. That's how small we are in the scale of our system when you look from the outside in. We are a dot, an epic dot, but a dot no doubt. As for Voyager 2, despite it launching before Voyager 1 by 16 days, it was set on a similar mission to explore the solar system, albeit via a different route that it took past Neptune and Uranus. The point here is that these two probes are the farthest things that humanity has sent into the solar system. They have traveled incredible distances and are still revealing things about our solar system that continue to both boggle the mind and astound us. One of the most important things about these particular probes right now is that they are in interstellar space, meaning that they are indeed beyond our solar system, and they're seeing all sorts of interesting things and helping us learn even more about our universe. But of course that raises a very fundamental question in terms of science and distance. If the Voyager 1 and 2 are in interstellar space, how the heck are we communicating with it? Distance matters in communications, as we all know, and the farther you travel from a point, the harder it is to communicate. So since we're not just talking about space, but outside of our solar system via interstellar space, how are we reaching the probes? The simple answer to that is the Deep Space Network, also known as the DSN. This is a series of radio antenna that work together to not just send signals into space, but receive the signals from the craft and even give it instructions on what to do next. Just as important though is this network of antenna are all over the world. There are DSN locations near Canberra, Australia, Madrid, Spain, and Goldstone, California. Those sites are almost evenly spaced around the planet. That means as the Earth turns, we never lose sight of a spacecraft, which obviously is very important when it comes to mapping out the universe and knowing where all of your biggest assets are. We've been using the system to detect the Voyagers 1 and 2 since their launch, and clearly they are effective. But I'm sure you're not getting all of your questions answered, because I'm sure you're noticing a flaw in this plan. Mainly we have a big set of satellite antenna here on Earth, but the probe itself is rather small. So how does something that small beam signals back to these antenna? Well honestly, you're thinking of it a bit backwards. You see to make the Voyager probes worth it in terms of science study, as well as a long-term investment, both of them had to be outfitted with as many scientific instruments as possible, some of which are still working today despite them being very old. Anyway, when it came to the communication system, NASA had to make a compromise. The system on the probes itself is honestly very small, so much so that they send only the weakest of signals back to Earth, which would eventually be a problem. Except to counter this, NASA and others around the world made very big antenna in order to make sure that they were seeing their craft at all times and getting their signals. So despite the signals being weak, the long reach of the antenna ensure that we always receive the signals as a whole. However, there is a catch to this. 
the farther away a spacecraft is, the larger the antenna you need to detect its signal. The largest antenna at each DSN site is 70 meters, 230 feet in diameter, and one is actually being built right now to be even bigger than that. Before we dive into that new antenna though, be sure to like or dislike the video so that we can continue to improve and make you the best videos possible. Also be sure to subscribe so that way you don't miss any of our weekly videos. NASA is upgrading the radio dish in Australia that mission team members used to send commands to Voyager 2, which again launched in 1977 and entered interstellar space in November of 2018. Voyager 2 will be on its own until that work is done in January 2021, though the spacecraft will still be able to beam science data home. This is very important to note for the basic reason of the probe is not at full capacity in terms of its power. The Voyager 2 probe is already past its expiration date, and many of its systems don't work anymore. A glitch that recently occurred proved that the probe may not be as responsive as it once was, as it shut down the probe after using too much reserve power. So if something like this happens again, it'll be drifting in space on its own for who knows how long until NASA can get this dish up and thus re-establish contact with it. True, the DSN tries to make sure this doesn't happen, but with the largest dish down, there is a blind spot that can be exploited. Despite the potential risks this entails, the team at NASA aren't too worried, it appears. We put the spacecraft back into a state where it will be just fine, assuming that everything goes normally with it during the time that the antenna is down. Voyager project manager Suzanne Dodd, who also serves as director of the Interplanetary Network Directorate at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, said in a statement Wednesday, March the 4th. If things don't go normally, which is always a possibility, especially with an aging spacecraft, then the onboard fault protection that's there can handle the situation, Dodd added. So hopefully everything goes well, and once this new antenna is up, we can have a whole new way of detecting the signals from both these probes, and any future ones that we launch into space. So it's very much a case of short-term upgrading for long-term gain. But at this point, I'm sure you're still confused on some of the things that go on with the DSN once they receive the signals from the probes. Again, the signals that the Voyager spacecraft send out are very weak. In fact, they're so weak that they couldn't even power a digital watch. So how is it exactly that we're able to discern anything from them? Centers at each DSN site receive incoming information. Then they send it to the Space Flight Operations Facility at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. There, the photos and other data are processed and shared with scientists and the rest of us. And when the situation requires it of them, they're able to boost the signals of the probes so that they can be detected by the satellites. Thus, no information is lost as long as they continue to send signals, which is why the recent loss of the Voyager 2 was highlighted for a time because NASA couldn't find it or get info from it until it got turned back on. So now that you understand how the probes work and how they're communicating with us back here on Earth, you might be thinking, what was some of the things that they picked up out in space that are so important? The truth of the matter is that they've done a lot. Just when they were in the solar system, they got pictures of planets and moons that helped us truly define them in certain ways, including getting us closer looks at them than we had ever gotten before. Plus, as noted, they are now in interstellar space, a feat that before them mankind had never been able to achieve before. In the context of this video, though, they're past the heliosphere. This is where solar winds emitted from our sun still blow things outwards. So in many ways, the probes are away from the reach of the sun. But what Voyager 2, backed up by data from Voyager 1, found last year is that once they're outside the reach, the plasma that is out in space doesn't go down. It actually goes up in density by a large margin. The marked increase in plasma density is evidence of Voyager 2 journeying from the hot, lower density plasma characteristic of the solar wind to the cool, higher density plasma of interstellar space. It's also similar to the plasma density jump experienced by Voyager 1 when it crossed into interstellar space. And this means, what exactly? Well, it means that there is a literal wall of plasma fire just outside of our solar system. 
according to the probes. And that is a problem in many, many ways. Yes, it's cool beyond belief, but it's also very problematic. The wall of fire outside the solar system is caused by electromagnetic EM radiation, which is created by plasma and a local space environment full of raging magnetic fields. But while this is terrifying, it proves that NASA was right to launch not one but two probes to go and explore the universe. Because for all we knew, the wall of fire might have just been in one centralized location than a place basically filling up the boundaries of the outer solar system. The Voyager probes are showing us how our Sun interacts with the stuff that fills most of the space between stars in the Milky Way galaxy, said Ed Stone, project scientist for Voyager and a professor of physics at Caltech. Without this new data from Voyager 2, we wouldn't know if what we were seeing with Voyager 1 was characteristic of the entire heliosphere or specific just to the location and time when it crossed. Why should we care about a wall of fire? Because we eventually want to travel outside of our solar system, eventually, remember? Sure, we're focused on getting to the moon again and setting our first colony on Mars, but trust me when I say that many are focused on getting to places like Alpha Centauri, over four light years away for the record, and beyond, and that means we'll have to deal with the wall of fire eventually. So by having this information from both the probes, we know the size, the general shape, and the composition of this wall of fire. And that means that we can plan for it, prepare for it, and more. Granted, this obstacle would take a lot more research to figure out a solution to, including sending specialized probes, aka not the Voyager duo, to the wall of fire in order to see how spaceships can avoid it. We know there is a way past it because the Voyagers are beyond it now, but will that help with spaceships? Will the wall of fire be bigger than it is now when we next reach it? It's hard to say, but the fact that we know it's there is enough for right now thanks to the Voyagers. And in truth, that is without a doubt the greatest benefit to the Voyager space probes. Yes, they're old, their systems are failing, and we have to keep upgrading to get their signals on Earth. But they provide us with information that would be impossible for us to get on our own. Who knows how long that wall of fire has been out there in space. All we know is that we found it in 2019 because of two very old probes and not the other wonders of technology we claim to have. So the longer these probes stay on and the longer we're able to decipher their information and more to decode the mysteries of space, the better off we're going to be. Plus they'll serve as the backbone and the standard bearers for all future probe missions. What we learn from these two and what we'll continue to learn from these two will shape things for a long time. And for that, we should be very, very grateful. And who knows, maybe in another month or two, one of the DSN will get information from the probes that will change everything. At this point, I wouldn't be that surprised. Thanks for watching everyone. What did you think about this look into the Voyager space probes and how they connect with us here on Earth? Do you think it's awesome how much these probes have discovered? How much longer do you think they'll last out there in space? Do you think the next versions of them will live up to what they've done? Let me know in the comments below. Be sure to subscribe and I'll see you next time on the channel.